Well, hey guys, my name is James Lassley, um, and I'm honored to be uh, helping you prepare for your life group lesson this week. Um, it's exciting times. We're starting the book of Daniel. Um, this is a fantastic and really extraordinary book of the Bible, one of my personal favorites. And so I'm excited to dig into the Word, uh, to get into it with you guys. Um, before we get started with the actual lesson, because we're beginning a new book, I think it's important to provide you all uh, with just a little bit of context of what you're reading. So the book of Daniel, uh, it's pretty obvious, it was written by Daniel himself. Um, this is affirmed both within the text and then also later in the New Testament, Jesus clarifies that this book was in fact written by the man it claims to be written by. Um, it's split up into two main sections. So the first half, the first six books of Daniel are primarily narrative or story. Uh, these are easy reading, these are easy to understand. However, the second half of the book is primarily um, apocalyptic, prophetic, poet, poetic literature. Um, and this can be a little more tricky, um, a little more difficult in interpretation, uh, but there is a lot of value, a lot of amazing truth to be found in really both sections of this book. Uh, Daniel was considered to be a prophet. Now, he's a little bit different than your standard Old Testament prophet. You see, when you think of prophets like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, these were men who, who stood up in front of the people of Israel and declared to them a word from the Lord. But Daniel never did that. You see, Daniel never actually preached at all. He never made these grand declarations to uh, the people of God. Instead, he wrote it down and he lived it. Nevertheless, he was referred to as a prophet both by his contemporaries, uh, such as Ezekiel, who, who actually knew of Daniel. They lived around the same time. Um, and once again, it's Jesus himself. Um, so the book of Daniel, it takes place during a really, really difficult time in Israel's history. Uh, a really dark time. As you know, the nation split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, this southern kingdom, it was comprised of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and the northern kingdom was made up of the rest of the tribes. Now, the northern kingdom was not good. It was led by wicked kings, and, and king after king after king led them further and further and deeper into sin. And so, contrary to all of the beliefs that the false prophets declared to them, they were judged by God for their unending wickedness. And so in 722 BC, we watch as the Assyrians come in and completely wipe out this northern kingdom. Now the southern kingdom, they remained a little bit longer. Uh, they did have some really terrible kings, but they also had a few good ones in the mix. Uh, unfortunately, though, these good kings were not able to fix this problem of, of Israel's sinfulness, of their wickedness, and they continued time and time again to return back to their wicked ways. Now, God gave them several warnings, the greatest of which was watching as the northern kingdom was judged by God. I mean, the southern kingdom witnessed as, as the Assyrians came and wiped out those who used to be a part of their kingdom. On top of that, God sent several prophets. He sent Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, all to declare to them that they needed to repent or God would judge them. But after all of that, they remained in their sinful ways. And so God came through on his word. And he sent the kingdom of Babylon, who first wiped out the Assyrians, wiped out the Egyptians, and they eventually came to Jerusalem and took them out as well. Now this judgment came over the span of about 30 years. You see, the Babylonians actually came and besieged the city three different times. And what they would do each time they would come in, they would attack the city, they would destroy the property, they would kill many of the people, and then they would take captives, and they would take them back to Babylon to live as exiles there. And so they would come in these waves, they would do this until the third and final time. And when they arrived in Jerusalem for the third time, they completely destroyed the city. They knocked down the walls, and worst of all, they tore down the temple of God. This was the end of Jerusalem and seemingly the end of God's people. And that's the context of what's going on when the book of Daniel is written. A dark, tragic, hopeless time. 
But we see a theme from the very first verses of the book all the way through the end. And that is that God is in control. And that's the idea that Daniel teaches about in our text today and all throughout the book. That even in the midst of great hopelessness, God is on the throne, God is sovereign, and God is over all things. So as we prepare to teach this week, um, not only is the context of the book important, but so is the context of the actual story that we're going to be digging into. Our passage is Daniel 1, verses 8 through 21. But as you're preparing, I highly recommend that you go ahead and read the first seven verses as well. They provide a context to what is going on in just the story, the, the flow of thought. So what is in these first seven verses? Well, essentially this. It describes how the Babylonians came and they, they conquered Jerusalem. And when they did that, they took several captives back to Babylon. And Daniel, the main character, he's one of these captives. And so this man, who was really no more than a teenager, it's estimated that he was probably around the age of 15. So a kid was taken away from his home. He's likely watched his parents to be killed and is brought thousands of miles over to this new foreign land. And what they did with these captives is they, they gathered up the best, the brightest, the most talented, the best looking, the ones with all the promise, and they brainwashed them. They, they taught them the customs of the culture of Babylon. They taught them the beliefs of their pagan religion. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to form the best and brightest of all of these different kingdoms that they conquered into their image and make them into these little Babylonians. They were spreading their own culture. Now, along with Daniel, there are three men, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And you probably know these better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's important to see that they changed their names from their Jewish names, which were an honor to God, to these pagan names, these names that were actually worshiping their pagan gods. And so at this point, there is a great problem for the character. All, all of these men, the question that is on their heads is this, is God really in control? That's where their mind is at. They've watched their entire home be destroyed. They've watched the temple of God be desecrated. And, and in this culture, when one kingdom took out the temple of another kingdom, that told them that their God was superior to the God whose temple was destroyed. And so as far as the Babylonians were concerned, they have stopped Yahweh. They have destroyed Yahweh. And so the temple's been defiled. The best and brightest of Israel have been corrupted. And their very identities, their very names and who they are have been changed. All is hopeless. And I think this brings up a good discussion point even as you begin digging into the text and digging into your lesson. And that is this. Does it ever feel like God's not in control? Sure, we know that he always is. But are there times in our lives when we feel like he isn't? Something to talk about. But here's an important detail that helps us to understand the text that you're going to be teaching this week. It's in verse 2, and it says that it was the Lord that gave the king into the hand of the Babylonians. It was God that allowed all of this to happen. Even in the midst of all of this destruction, it was God who was in control. It was God who was at work. And that's where we begin in verse 8. So let's read verse 8. This is the first verse of the passage that you're all teaching. It says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile, defile himself. Now this word resolved is a very strong word. Some texts use the word he made up his mind. Others say he determined in his heart. Now, a lot can be said about this mental posture that he has towards the decision that he has made. This is a firm declaration to himself. This is a strong conviction. This 
is a decision that he's not going to change. I, I heard this, this point illustrated well by a pastor one time. He said, many of us feel like we can't stop a particular sin that we struggle with, whether it's lying, cursing, pornography, blowing up in anger. We feel that we are incapable of resisting because we've failed so many times. But this is what he said. He said, consider if someone came in and kidnapped your child and they told you that if you ever cursed again that day, or if you told a lie that day, or if you watched porn that day, or if you blew up in anger that day, then they would kill your child. Not a single person would struggle with any of those sins. Because the idea is this. You have the strength to say no. You have the strength to choose not to sin. What we lack is the resolve. And so I think this would be a great point of discussion for you guys. And you can ask this, what sin do you need to resolve to abstain from? What do you need to decide to not do or to do? Because we have the Holy Spirit, we have all of the power, all of the strength we need to reject sin, to resist some temptation, and to walk as God has called us to walk. I think sometimes what we as Christians need to do is to decide to do just that. Now, it's important to understand, Daniel is not just defying the king for the sake of being defiant. You see, this food was considered to be unclean to him. It was often practiced that the food for the king had been sacrificed to these pagan gods. The wine that he drank was part of a sacrifice ritual to these pagan gods. And so for Daniel to eat and drink what the king had for him would be to honor these foreign gods. And in doing so, he's dishonoring the true God. And so this is not a matter of just defiance or rebellion. This is a matter of obedience to the Lord. That's what this comes down to for Daniel. And understand this. This proposal that he makes, this this test that he sets up, to even question the king could very well have cost him his life. If you notice in verse, uh, was it 10, the, the eunuch says that he fears that the king would have his head for even considering this. Add to that, that Daniel had just watched thousands and thousands of people be killed by these Babylonians. There is no question in his mind that if the king was even a little bit frustrated, he could have Daniel killed and not think twice about it. Daniel's life is worth nothing to this king. And so to even propose an alternative idea, he knew good and well that that could have been his death sentence. And yet, he had the resolve to do it. He had the decision that he would rather be faithful to God, no matter what it cost. Now, I think it's important as we dig in and as we seek to explain and apply this text, that we don't just reduce the story of Daniel down to certain things that we should do. We don't want people to just walk away being told, do this, do this, and do this. Instead, it comes much more down to what we believe. Because as we read this story, it's not just that we should be like Daniel because he had integrity. It's we see that God is in control. We see that God is strong. And it's because he is in control, because he is on the throne, that we can trust him. And that we are free to live with integrity. And so it's not just about doing something. It's about believing the right thing so that we have the ability and the means to do the right thing. A good question to ask would be this. Why was Daniel able to have such integrity? Why was Daniel able to have such boldness and courage to do the right thing even when it was hard? The answer is simple. He feared God more than the king, and he knew that God was in control. It gave him the freedom to live with integrity, and it can do the same for us. 
as the verse continues, we see this awesome story unfold, and we see how God protects Daniel in light of, of his faithfulness to him. Verse 9, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So would you endanger my head with the king? But then Daniel answered and said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter. And he tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. We see God instantly act to protect Daniel as he sought to be faithful to him. We see God instantly move to take care of the needs of Daniel as Daniel was focusing on honoring God. You see, this entire challenge that Daniel proposed for him to receive vegetables and water versus the the much more fulfilling, the much more satisfying uh, uh, meat and food of the king's table, the wine of the king's cup, this entire challenge hinged on God acting miraculously. The only way this was going to work, the only way that Daniel and his peers were going to come out healthier, better, and safe was if God worked a miracle. But that's what Daniel trusted God to do because he knew that God was in control. Now, it's important to note that the reason they ate vegetables and water was not because they knew of some secret Christian diet plan that would be really popular centuries later. This is not that they were trying to just be healthier than everyone else. And, and let's be honest, these guys were not trying to lose weight or slim down their waistline. These guys probably had been starving for months on end as the Babylonians were sieging their city. Then on top of that, they were forced to walk nonstop from sunrise to sunset thousands of miles for two weeks straight as they were carried out in captivity to Babylon. In this world, at this time, you don't want to be thin and skinny because you don't want to starve to death. No, to be healthy is to have some meat on your bones, to have some fat on your body. And so they were not trying to be healthy. They were trying to be holy. This is all about honoring God and not eating the unclean food that would dishonor him. And it wasn't that the vegetables and water were healthier for them so much as it was that God worked a miracle for them. As the passage continues, we see not only does God work miraculously to provide and protect for Daniel and his peers, but he blesses them as a result of their faithfulness. Verses 17 through 21. As these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all the kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. We see that obedience generally results in blessing. When we trust God, God blesses us. God takes care of us. God provides for us. Now, I said generally for a reason. 
There's several stories you will read later in the book of Daniel where he is faithful and his friends are faithful and yet they are punished for it. They suffer for it. But even then, God still takes care of them. And so we, we want to be careful not to, to dig into a prosperity gospel where as long as you're good, as long as you're great, God's only going to give you things that make you happy, things that bless you, things that make you feel good. Obedience sometimes brings suffering. But we know for a fact that when we obey God and we trust God, He will bless us. He will take care of us. He will look after us. You see, Daniel and these men did what was right. They knew it was dangerous. They knew it was difficult. But they simply did what they knew was right. And they trusted God to take care of all the rest of the details. This reminds me, whenever I was uh, in college getting my undergrad, um, in one of my classes, the professor would assign reading. But instead of giving us quizzes on this reading, he would simply make us write down on a piece of paper signing whether or not we read the entire book. And now you can see the temptation there to not actually read it. The opportunity to be dishonest was, was as easy as it could ever be. And I remember coming down to the end of the semester and I had one book left assigned and, and my grade was right on the verge between one letter and the letter grade above. And I did the math and I realized that whether or not I said I read this book would be the difference between whether or not I got an A in the class or a B. But unfortunately, I didn't have the time to read the book. I didn't put in the effort to read the book. And so that put me in a really tight spot. And as I went to that last day of class and I was kind of prepared to, to be dishonest, I justified it in my head. I was, I was preparing, I was trying to earn a degree so I could do ministry. I was trying to major in Christian studies so that I can go and be a pastor. This is a good thing. This is a thing for God. But as I walked to the class, God convicted me. God said, I, he doesn't need me to get an A. God doesn't need me to get a degree. God doesn't need me to do anything. What God cares about is my character. In the same way, what God cares about most is how we obey Him. Anything else, He'll take care of the details. He'll take care of all of the difficulties that might come with obedience. What we should focus on is just obeying. It's easier to do the right thing when we know that God will make everything else turn out okay. So where does this leave us as we wrap up this text? Well, I think it's really easy to apply this text to uh, the people in your class's lives because we have a lot in common with Daniel without allegorizing the story because it is a true historical event that took place. We can see several similarities between our situation and Daniel's. First, we are both God's chosen peoples. We're both followers of the true God. But like him, we are both living in a land that is not our home. We are both living in a world where the powers at be are seeking to lead us away from God. Seeking to mold us and conform us into their image rather than the image of Christ. And so we're living in enemy territory that is ruled by a hater of God that seeks for us to return or rebel against our king. But just as Daniel understood and knew and saw that God was still in control, even when it was tough, just as God, or Daniel believed that God could provide for him and take care of him, and he was able to live with integrity because of that, so too can we. When life gets hard, when we're faced with challenges, when it is easier to take shortcuts, we can see and believe that God is in control, that God is on the throne. And because of that, we can walk with integrity. We can do the right thing knowing that God is going to work everything else out. And so I'm praying for you all as you prepare this week. I pray that as you study that God would speak to you uh, through this word. I pray that God would speak through you by this word as you teach it to your class. 
And I pray this week that you would walk in integrity, that you would honor the Lord, both when it's easy and when it's hard, because we know that God is seated on the throne and we can trust him.